This is the Reflection Podcast from St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Hawthorne Woods, Illinois. And I'm Ed Blonsky. I'm on the pastoral staff here at St. Matthew. You know, we all reflect the things that are most important in our lives. And the things that shine the brightest on our lives, that's what we reflect the brightest in our lives. On this podcast, I have conversations with people in whom God has made a difference and has called and equipped to make a difference to others in this increasingly dark world. My goal is for you to be encouraged as you listen, to see how God can use you to change the lives of others in this world and ultimately change the world itself. At the end of the podcast, I'll give you some information on how to connect with St. Matthew, and I hope that you will enjoy today's conversation. Let's see who's in the pastor's office today on this episode of The Reflection Podcast. In the pastor's office with me today is John Nunes. Thanks for joining me today, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Pastor Blonsky. Good to oh, be This is great. Um, I'm looking at you, and um, I'm kind of a little envious. You're, you're where it's warm, uh, in Santa Monica, California, I believe. We have great weather all year long. Uh, yeah. I, I, in fact, I, liter- I literally sleep with the window open all year round. So yeah, that doesn't awesome. work here for yeah. <laughs> in Chicago too well. Well, that's awesome. So I want to um, uh, introduce you. I want you to introduce yourself to the audience because you know you better than anyone else. Uh, maybe other than your wife and your mother might know you a little better. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, I'm an immigrant uh, to these uh, United States. I was born in Montego Bay, Jamaica, uh, but I got here as fast as I could. I uh, grew up in, in Canada, so I was born in a place where it's even warmer than here in Santa Monica, Montego Bay. And uh, my parents moved in pursuit of uh, education and opportunity to Canada, uh, where it's not as warm. Uh, in When I was uh, about four years old, grew up in the Toronto area and then moved to the U.S. at 18 uh, to go to college. Went to Concordia Ann Arbor, in fact, uh, for undergraduate. Got it. So uh, my sister's school, I went to Concordia, Wisconsin. So, uh, And uh, now those two are affiliated with each other. I really love that that's happening, too. Um, so it's Concordia University, Wisconsin, Ann Arbor together. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so tell us a little bit about growing up in Canada. Um, and, and really what I'm looking at uh, here from you is is maybe how that influenced you to get to where you are today. What were sure. some of the things that doing that? So I was blessed to be born into a family um, where faith was uh, core to who we were. Uh, my parents at uh, six weeks old carried me to the font uh, to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit at St. John uh, Methodist Church in Montego Bay. And uh, there was never any negotiation when I was growing up about uh, church or what it entailed. Um, as I sometimes jokingly say, my parents had a drug problem. Uh, every time the church doors open, they drug us to church. You've heard that one before, I'm sure. Yeah. And, uh, and we were there uh, fully participating in, you know, church activities. I, my father was the church organist and I was the assistant church organist. And I was playing before my feet could touch the pedal board. Uh, so it was um, as normal as life and the rhythm of life for us to be uh, deeply engaged in the, uh, in the things of faith. I was confirmed at 14 years old and went to youth group and uh, became a leader in the congregation as well early. Was that in the Methodist church then? Or did you? So, yeah, we converted to the Lutheran church. Um, we joined the Lutheran church. It was kind of a rocky beginning. Um, my mother had four children. I was the oldest of four and, um, we were very active and she was looking for a, uh, a summertime solution to her, her, her parental blues. And she discovered a three letter solution at, uh, the local Lutheran church. You probably know what that is. Vacation Bible school, VBS. That's vacation, That's... vacation Bible school. And she dragged us down there, uh, and, um, it kind of stuck. So... 
that's how we uh, that's how we became Lutheran. That's I, and I'm glad you said that because uh, I often will tell people wherever I'm at as a pastor how you know what what's the big deal about VBS? Oh, <laughs> you have no idea. So many people are introduced to the church. Doesn't matter if it's Lutheran church or not, but in Vacation Bible School, a lot of people are introduced to Jesus for the first time in Vacation Bible School as well. So yeah, it's such absolutely. so important, so important. So you um, we got you up to eight. 18 years old, and you decided to go to Michigan. So that's kind of, well, there was, was that a lateral move from Toronto uh, to go to Concordia? What, what, why, why Concordia, Ann Arbor? Uh, probably proximity. Um, and, you know, soon after that, the, um, the, the kind of pathway to my vocation was, was very clear. Within several months, I um, got a job at a church in Detroit, St. John Lutheran Church in Detroit. Where So I've been at this work for 42 years, um, for, you know, since I was 18 years old. I'm 60 now. So, um, And I was hired as the church musician and as the youth director and uh, was immediately uh, active in that work. Um, and then went to a seminary in... Um, St. Catharines, Ontario. Uh, lived in Buffalo, New York, and commuted across uh, the river. Um, was m- married to the magnificent Monique, and uh, we are blessed with uh, six children, um, and uh, now 13 grandchildren. We have 12 who are living. Uh, one died at birth, uh, but we count her life. Um, and we actually had a funeral for her, and I was blessed to carry uh, the pink miniature casket to uh, her final resting place uh, at a cemetery in Chicago. In fact, uh, Concordia Cemetery on the north side mm-hmm. of yes. Chicago. That uh, was a crisp. I, I call that the longest Lent of my life. Um, that when my you know you're you're a father, so you know uh, the sound of your daughters uh, when they call. And when my daughter called, I knew. She was nine months expecting, and, and um, I knew the, the moment I heard her voice, and she screamed, Daddy, uh, what, what had happened? Um, so, uh, but family's been a, an incredible blessing for me and for us, and um, it's kind of core to, uh, to, core to my identity. So you, you graduate from Concordia Ann Arbor, um, I assume with a degree in some kind of church work. So was, they had a, a program called the pre-ministerial program okay. in those days. So, uh, you know, Greek and Hebrew and Latin yep. and uh, all of the kind of necessary requirements. And, that was your golden uh, ticket to seminary. That was the golden ticket. And then um, Concordia Seminary St. Catharines was a great experience. Graduated with an MDiv there. And so through my 20s, I, you know, served uh, as a church musician and youth director. Through my 30s, I, I served as an urban pastor it back to the city of Detroit. In fact, that same congregation called me back to the city of Detroit. And then uh, in Dallas, Texas. Um, in my late 30s, uh, decided to go back to school uh, to get, I got another master's degree and then a PhD. And my 40s were really an exciting time in my life. I became the president and CEO of Lutheran World Relief in my 40s. I think that's when I met you uh, about you know, uh, 15, 16 years ago. And was able to travel the world, so traveled the continent of Africa, traveled Latin America, traveled uh, probably about 40 countries in the span of seven years when I was at Lutheran World Relief, um, and saw the work uh, there to transform lives around the world, um, incredibly powerful. Uh, and then through my 50s, um, slowed down a bit in terms of uh, the travel, and uh, was rooted in higher education. So first uh, an endowed professor at, at Valparaiso University, um, and then the president at uh, Concordia College in New York, most recently. So here I am at 60, and it's almost like a full circle, back to pastoral ministry and back to a local parish. And uh, and coincidentally, the, the little church we joined uh, when we moved to Canada was called Pilgrim Lutheran Church, and that's the, the name of this church here, where I am, here in Santa Monica. So tell us a little bit about the the uh, Pilgrim Lutheran in Santa Monica and what 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 is your role there? Santa Monica is a really tough place for ministry, uh, and West LA as a whole is a really tough place. It's um, and this congregation has really held on. Um, 
It's a small congregation. It has a very, very vibrant school ministry. Uh, it's a, um, it's a, uh, a classic Christian education school. So, uh, where they study philosophy and it's and Latin and it's, it's broadly interdenominational or ecumenical. And, um, and that's a good thing here in Santa Monica. Santa Monica is probably 90% unchurched. Uh, it's a very, very secular environment. Um, and this congregation I, it is incredibly well located um, on a major thoroughfare. In fact, it's the only church on Wilshire Boulevard between the Pacific Ocean and between the L.A. Uh, city line. Uh, so it's got a great location on a major thoroughfare um, and a uh, great opportunity for outreach, too. We're really um, fabulously located uh, to connect in the community. But, you know, in many ways, and I, you have a question later on about how the early church or first century church is so similar to the time in which we find ourselves. And I think that is incredibly clear here in this context in which we find ourselves here in, uh, in West LA and Santa Monica. Yes, I can. I, I'm thinking and envisioning in my, my mind's eye, you have your established congregation members and then people just in town for whatever reason. I mean, Santa Monica is a hub. Uh, you've got Hollywood just to the east of you and people coming to Los Angeles. And then you've got the beach just to the west of you and the pier to, and so many people. I'm, I, I can imagine you have new faces just about every single week in, in worship. Yeah, and you've that's got a, you've got a good sense of what goes on here. Exactly. Yeah, that's and that's an incredible opportunity where you you mentioned earlier that you had spent some time in Africa with Lutheran World Relief uh, and um, and and bringing the gospel, of course, to the mission field. That when you think mission field, I think that's that's kind of the the default understanding of mission field. You're going to go to Africa, or you're going to go to South America. The mission field just comes to you. You are right on the front lines of of the unchurched and those who uh, really do need to hear about Christ. And, and an incredible opportunity. I'm a little envious uh, being in suburbia of Chicago. It's um, you know, we have to really look for uh, opportunities to do that, which is, which we do. And and of course, God has gifted us in different ways. And that's that's really uh, an incredible opportunity for you to be there at that time and for such a time as this. Um, so yeah, let's talk about uh, a little bit about that ministry or any of the other ministries. I mean, you, you've been a, a college pr professor, you've been a college president, you've been on out in the uh, foreign mission field, now you're in the national mission field or the, the local mission field. What are some of the um, things that, that are happening that you knew this was what was gonna be and then maybe some of the things that completely took you by surprise? That's a great question. Um, so, you, do you mean in terms of my own vocational trajectory? Sure, it's taken me by surprise. I or, think so, but also in the see, church, yeah. Or what I see in the church. I, I want. I do want to jump to that first century question. Sure, because I think uh, the environment in which we find ourselves is very similar to the early church. It's a very uh, primal, raw. Uh, so, for example, let me uh, tell a little story. I was um, in a local grocery store, and the woman who was bagging my uh, bread and um, I don't know what else I got, oatmeal, steel-cut oatmeal, I forget what else was on the list. Uh, her name was Anastasia, so it said across her, ba her name badge, Anastasia. She was maybe 20, 21 years old. And I said, oh, Anastasia, what a cool name. And she said, yeah, she said, um, uh, I, I kind of like my name. It's, it's unique, but I like it. And I said, well, where'd you get it from? She said, my parents were big fans of that old school, you know, from way back in the day, um, video, cartoon video about Anastasia. Like back in the day, 90, 1997 is back in the day, we're old school, so I felt old immediately. And then she said, um, and that's where they got the name from. I said, well, do you know what your name means? And she says, I have no idea what it means. It's like from the cartoon character. And I said, well, not at all. Your name has a really deep meaning. Uh, your name means resurrection. And she looked at me dumbfounded. I mean, uh, she wasn't like uh, being coy. She, and she said, resurrection, she, what's, a, what's a resurrection? And she, she really meant it. I mean, she wasn't you know, trying to you know, be funny. Um, and I think that's kind of the state of the culture. 
it's we, we it's not as even as if there's like antagonism towards the faith it's that people are almost entirely unaware of the things of god or the matters of the faith and um this so the story or the narrative that congregations like pilgrim just assume and take for granted are not in the culture anymore so we've got we've got kind of culture making work that we have to do and and it often feels like we're on the losing side of things like in the first century when they felt like they were on the losing i mean and you know and people talk about you know oh the persecution of the church i don't think the church is persecuted i mean the loss of tax exempt status does not constitute persecution or people sneering at you or not liking you that's not persecution so we need to look back at the early church where they sacrificed their very lives for the sake of the faith and that's where we see real persecution and we can learn a lot from them one of the things I love about uh, the early church, in fact, I'm reading a book right now, and you ask for names of books. It's called The Patient, uh, the Ferment, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. And uh, there's, a, there's a line in that book that I really like, and it talks about how in the early church, there was a sense that the mission of God in the world was both unhurried and unstoppable. So they had a kind of patient um, approach to engaging the culture. And I think we, we can learn from that. Uh, I think too often uh, people of faith are impatient with the culture and with people in the culture. Well, Anastasia, I mean, you don't know what a resurrection is? I mean, what's wrong with you? You know, what kind of pagan, you know, um, parents did you have or you know and then shaking our head and wagging our head and wagging our fingers at people and I, and I think that's not the approach that is obviously that's not the approach that is um, that we are called to in our time and I'm more and more convinced um, that love is patient in fact I've been signing even emails caritas patiens est love is patient and I think it's it's that kind of unhurried, unstoppable confidence that should exude the way we engage people in the world. And I think we can learn a lot from the saints uh, in, in, in Scripture and in the early church uh, with, with that sort of approach. It's interesting to me, as I'm listening to you say, say that story, I'm, I'm thinking ahead. Uh, I'm preaching not this weekend, but the, the following weekend. Uh, on a sermon series on, uh, it's called Like Fine Wine, and it's from the Isaiah passages. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is that um, we are we are made into like a fine wine by God, and it takes time. Uh, you know, an aged wine takes time, but it's inevitable. It's going to be great, but it's going to take time. Um, interesting, too, about uh, Anastasia. Uh, so many people bemoan the fact that um, we've lost the 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 language of the to the culture, uh, and so we need to change our language to meet the culture where it's at. And I'm not so sure that that's true. I think the 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 culture has the language; they just don't know what it means. And so we already have a connection, like with Anastasia. Um, she has the name, and and you know what it means. So now you get to bridge the gap to talk about the resurrection of ultimately of course jesus christ and that's you know that whole uh, they have the language they, they they know the words they just don't know what they mean and now they're I, there's I, 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 I could not agree with you more and uh, they, they have the language um, and even deeper than the language i believe that all humans at one level or another because of the way we are fearfully and wonderfully made um are are haunted are stricken with a hauntedness for god you know augustine says it right you have made us for yourself O lord and our souls are restless until they find rest in you we all i, I think and i see that a lot in um in this kind of environment although there there is not the profession of the christian faith there is a deep yearning for a connection to the transcendent and to something that matters in life and for um, a deep almost pining for a, a way to interpret what's happening in my life so i agree with you they have the language they have the experience they have the categories and part of our job then is to be meaning makers 
in the lives of people and help them to kind of connect the dots with what God is already up to in their lives. I mean, God is already, it's not like God shows up when we show up. <laughs> God was already at work uh, through the power of the Spirit in their lives. And I think part of our calling is to help them to see the work that God is already doing um, in, in, the, in their own lives. So when we talk about the mission of the church here in the 21st century, which as you're making the case, looks a lot like the first century. And so 2,000 years, nothing has changed. Uh, but are there unique challenges that we have today uh, that maybe the maybe a lot of the first century church wouldn't have imagined? Oh, of course. Uh, you know, um, one of the unique challenges is also one of the unique blessings that we have. Uh, the very fact that I can sit here on one coast and you're on – the third coast <laughs> of Chicago, and we can have this lifetime conversation is a, a miracle of technology. Uh, but of course, I'm saying the obvious, technology introduces a lot of ethical questions. Transhumanism is, is a problem. Um, generative AI, uh, which is the next generation of AI, is a problem. Uh, but I think for us to just demonize then uh, technology or to demonize um, these advances of science uh, is irresponsible. Um, you know, God gives us all good things. It's how we order and use the things that God gives us uh, that determines um, uh, a thing. So I, you know, I think we can be sometimes overreactive uh, to some of the the new things in in the world and um, where our, our calling is to be more interpretive uh, of what they are and how they are to be used. It is one of our legacies as uh, our, current, our, our, our specific tribe of Christianity is Lutheranism. And not a lot of people understand, you know, they, they wonder what are Lutherans. And, but one of our legacies is to use the, the technology of the day to bring the timeless gospel of Christ to the world. I mean, Martin Luther uh, used the, the up-and-coming technology of the printing press to great effect. Uh, and then closer to our day, um, with uh, the advent of radio, uh, you, you, I know that you are connected to the Lutheran Hour, and I have a sort of an ethereal connection to the Lutheran Hour. I happen to work in the radio station where the Lutheran Hour started when I was at the seminary, so I, I do have one connection there. Um, and uh, that we use that to great effect, that we're not afraid of it. We're not afraid of this technology. And now I think churches, especially since uh, the pandemic, have embraced this technology uh, for um, podcasting and live streaming services, that we people already have this technology in their hands. Now we can show them uh, in a very real way, here's Jesus who hasn't changed at all. He still is powerful. He's still vital. He's still relevant. To, uh, to this culture as well. Again, it's that unanxious, unhurried, unstoppable confidence uh, that God is at work um, that uh, I think norms and forms and shapes the way we engage the world as a whole. Agreed. The, um, again, I, t I said we were Lutherans. We're specifically in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, which is a United States uh, church body, uh, just recently launched a new um, effort called Set Apart to Serve, which is to bring up another generation of church workers, pastors, teachers, deaconesses, and, and, and such. Um, what are, and you may not have anything to do with that or, or have, uh, uh, something to say specifically about that program, but bring, what can the church, Big C Church too, not just Lutherans, but Christians around the world, how can we bring up a new generation of leaders that will take over for us? I mean, we're we're at sort of at the end of our careers, uh, you know, sitting in the late fifties, early sixties now. Uh, but uh, w how are we going to bring up more people to reflect God to this world? Reached out to a number of um, sort of proteges uh, to pose this question to them because I thought that uh, I, I think you're really on to something and I'm not the best person to answer it because like you just said, you know, we're sort of at the end of the curve. Um, and I, I received some really interesting answers. Um, and what I found uh, 
utterly surprising about uh, the four responses that I received was how unsurprising the answers are. So I think oftentimes we think that there's like four quick tips or three easy steps or seven highly effective habits that are going to help us to, you know, change the world. And, and I, I, I you know, and that, that's probably, uh, and I think we overrate sometimes innovation and what innovation can, can do. Uh, the answers were pretty straightforward. You know, one person said, uh, we have to return to spiritual practices at home. Now, I mean, that's as old as, <laughs> as the church is old, okay? The catechism wasn't written for confirmation class. The catechism was written for the pater familius, right? The head of the household to teach the faith to his children and his family. Um, and, 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 you know, the kind of rhythm of prayer life in the home precedes the monastic rhythm of prayer life. In fact, the monastic model is kind of ordered off of or fashioned off of the prayer life in the home. So that was actually one of the answers that, that someone gave to me. So, I, you know, I'm sorry that it's not a, you know, groundbreaking, shocking answer, but sometimes it's the, it's the simple thing. Another uh, response I received um, and this is one of the students that I actually recruited for ministry. And he, he suggested that um, we, and this, uh, this is kind of a controversial topic because, you know, we do have um, these alternate routes to, to ministry. You know, he, he took exception with them. And he said that we need to form pastoral candidates in a community of mentors and fellow mentees uh because it's in you know community that formation happens now, i thought that was you know again i mean you're looking for <laughs> you're looking for something groundbreaking sorry uh it's not uh, another person spoke of the need for individuals to have mystical transformative encounters with christ that deeply embed their faith and, and this person um uh, from uh, the Roman Catholic tradition, uh, pointed out uh, that one the Pew Research recently uncovered the fact that one out of every three Roman Catholics doesn't believe in the real presence of Christ, which is one of the ways, in, obviously, that we encounter Christ is in the sacrament. And we, Lutherans, of course, also have this doctrine of the real presence. But I wonder if we take it seriously enough, namely that Christ is really coming to us and for us uh, in this sacrament. Uh, so again, you know, uh, sorry for not having more interesting answers, but uh, something like a return to, uh, you know, kind of a word and sacrament basis. And then finally, uh, one answer I liked a lot said that we have to understand that millennials and Gen Zs aren't joiners. So we need to think about new ways of understanding what does it mean to belong to the body of Christ? Because I think we're kind of stuck in the West and in North America, especially, with a kind of um, a membership model that is no different than the Rotary or you know <laughs> any other kind of club or association that you belong to. And so maybe maybe we need to think more dynamically about the body of Christ as a living organism in which people are kind of connected to each other. Uh, because millennials aren't uh, joiners in that traditional kinds of sense. So I thought that last one was probably the most timely. But again, I think we can sometimes, again, overreact and think we got to do something vastly, radically new to change the world. And so sorry for being a stick in the mud. Uh, <laughs> but I did the research, and that's what the research said. I actually reached out to people, and that's what they said. I think that is... Uh kind of working backwards from that yeah what's old is new again and the it, it just goes back to that we don't really have to reinvent the wheel um and, and i like that yeah we went through that phase of the joiners and and then finding another way because you're right um people just don't um, they, there, there are no, well, for the most part, I guess, yacht clubs. I, this is something that I, I've, I encountered in a previous congregation where um, members of the church couldn't come to an event because they had a meeting of the yacht club, and they never missed those meetings at the yacht club. And I'm thinking to myself, where did we miss the boat, literally, on that? Of <laughs> They got that, but they don't get that at church. 
And I was thinking about that too. Somebody was mentioning how few people are in church these days. You know, where is everybody? When I was growing up, the church was full and we used to know everybody. And it's interesting. I thought about it as I was lying in bed last night, not sleeping for some reason. God must have been, you know, kind of think about this, that when they joined the church when they were younger, and these are people that are older than me now, um, that church was there. And, and they joined or they, they were part of a congregation that was already there. And maybe we need to start thinking about this is new. And uh, this is, uh, you, you just can't say, well, this is the way we've always done it. I think that's, this is a, 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 a riff on that variation. We're not going to always do it this way. We are looking at new ways, but again, it's the old ways again. Uh, it's it going back to the ways. family. Yeah. Speaking of the old ways, uh, there's a um, a philosopher and and uh, writer uh, named James K. A. Smith. Do you know that name? I'm not familiar with yeah, it. He's uh, I think he teaches at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, and he observes back to our point around uh, the use of technology that in a time of uh, perpetual distraction where people are just uh, ripped at a core level with the demands for their attention. Uh, everywhere they turn, you know, I, I went to a restaurant uh, not long ago, great little barbecue spot here in Santa Monica, and the thing that caught my attention about the restaurant is that everything in the restaurant was designed to catch my attention. There were screens, like eight different screens with eight different sporting events on the screen you know australian football and you know nfl highlights and you know the la dodgers and just, just and then the music was like loud and uh you ordered off of uh like a qr code and everywhere you look was just lights and technology and just this this sense of distraction and what distraction does of course is that it uh, it eviscerates us. It cuts us. To sh it kind of shreds our sense of focus. So when you think of th practices like prayer, and you think practices like silence, and and sitting before God, I mean that all of that, those kinds of uh, contemplative, the contemplative side. I think churches, in in many ways, and this is all old stuff. You know, need to pay more attention to the kind of contemplative practices, like even just reading the Psalms with a simple candle, okay, and allowing the Word to become a part of who we are, it might be a welcome practice for people in an over-absorbed, over, uh, obs uh, in, in a culture obsessed with uh, noise and technology. So, that when, uh, years ago, I went on a retreat uh, for youth leaders. And it was at a, um, a Roman Catholic retreat center. And in the evening we did, I think it's pronounced Lectio Divina. That's it. And, and they had the candles and we just um, sat there in the quiet and, and, and heard or read the Word of God. And it sounds so simple and, and well, my kids will think that's boring. Oh. <laughs> But it wasn't. It was powerful it, just to hear the word of God. God's, God's, uh, was it Martin Franzman once said that the Spirit of God walks between the words of Scripture. <laughs> uh, right? And so yeah. uh, this is not just an ordinary word for us. This is a, a life giving word. This is a, a word that is uh, a, a dynamic word. It is with the word that God creates the world. <laughs> Yeah. With the word that you know, Christ brings people back to life, uh, and so with the word, we we are forgiveness is pronounced. So yeah, it's so it's not just ordinary words. Yeah, right. These are not just words. Exactly, they're not just words on a page or words that we speak. Yeah, uh, they are living. They are breathing, right. um, and, and they are living and breathing in us. It's the breath of but, God. But again, to your question, I think the mission of the church needs to take that seriously because. <laughs> The pace of life, the tempo of life. You know, you, you talk to fam so-called families. You know, and I, one of the questions I ask them is, you know, how many meals do you have a day? At, in my marriage counseling, I ask that question every time. How many meals do you plan <laughs> to have a day at you know together? Well, so maybe one. I said it better at least be one. I mean, this is a you know this is a kind of a core thing, and families are scattered all over the place. Children are overprogrammed. 
I mean, they're, they're over-involved, you know. So for us to take seriously, you know, and then so when churches just come up with all these new programs for people, <laughs> thanks so much. Now i got another thing I can feel guilty about not doing, you know. Right, and the first thing that's going to be chopped off the list to do is going to be at the church, I, I would think, too. It's almost like you were listening to my conversation with my wife this morning because we were talking about this. What can we do as a church? And she was t- saying, we just need to come together just to have some right. time together. It doesn't have to be a worship service. And, you know, We do that. We do that well, but just to be together. Just to be together. That's right. Yeah, to be to be the body of Christ, to be that community of faith together. You know, this is so. You know, you ask about books I might recommend. This book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, "Life Together." I mean, it 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 has been life giving for me. You can't open a page and not you know find something in it that is uh, incredibly powerful. That's uh, I, I am writing. That's what I'm doing over here is yeah. writing it down. So I just I just randomly <laughs> open a page and I've I've got it marked on almost every page. <laughs> and he speaks, and this is from the community that he, and I think it's a book that speaks to our time. So he says, for example, I can never know in advance how God's image should appear in others. So, you know, I'm, now we're talking to the, the way we judge and judge people by the way they look. Or by, and if you're judging people by the way they look in, in LA, in West LA, and in Santa Monica, you're not going to talk to anybody because there's some scary looking people, right? Right. Down by the beach, there's some very scary looking So we cannot. We can never know in advance. To me, that form may seem strange, even ungodly. But he goes on to say that this diversity is a reason for rejoicing in one another and serving one another. So what do we do with diversity? We live in a culture where we have an incredible amount of diversity. Do we take it as an opportunity to to rejoice and to serve one another, for example? But I find this book to be um, it just, a, it's, and it's called The Prayer Book of the Bible. And so it's also got a book about reading the Psalms uh, towards the end. Great. I, I assume it's still in print since you got a copy of it. Absolutely still in print. Augsburg okay. Fortress. Oh, good. Okay. So I will have a link for that um, yeah, in so the show notes. So Haber says in here, the first service that we owe to the other is listening. Not speaking. Not talking. Yep. Listening. You know, I know we've got a lot to proclaim, and I know some people, was it, who is it, Luther, the church is the mund house, the, 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 the mouthpiece of God. I get it, okay? And, you know, and preaching is a thing we do. But maybe it's listening. It's, Silence does not mean being incapable of speech, but it means that you have a mystical desire to get beyond the word. <laughs> or in between the words, like you said. In between the words. Yes. To bring the metaphor in. The silence yeah. of the Christian is listening silence, humble silence. No one speaks more confidently than the one who remains gladly silent. Oh. Beautiful words. So, so you think about, you know, what our culture thinks about church people. And our culture thinks that church people talk too much and they just yell at people about Jesus. In fact, you can go down to the pier, since we're talking about the Santa Monica Pier, and they're, they're, you're, every day they got street preachers out there just yelling at people, of course, about sexual sins. That's their favorite, right? And so that's the image that people have of what these Christians are. And so I think, you know, with this sort of approach, to remain gladly silent, no one speaks more confidently than that person. And, and he would know, <laughs> Bonhaver, because he, he, there was a point where he wasn't silent anymore, and it got, it got him in trouble. So hanged by a piano wire yeah. at the Flossenburg prison camp. A single piano wire hanged him uh, just days before the prison camp was liberated. Yeah, in World War Two. Yeah. But to the point of the blood of the martyrs, though, is you know the seat seat of the church. I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, Tertullian said it. Yep, and it's that's a powerful quote that sometimes we need to remember as well. Interesting that earlier you said that you don't feel the church is being persecuted, at least not in the United States. Uh, this is there not is, persecuted. Yeah, there is there, true persecution. Global, you can find you can find global persecution of Christians, yeah. but it doesn't happen in the United States. I had that same conversation with Greg you know, Seltz. The, pro- the problem we have in the U.S. is we're no longer the central of the co- center of the culture anymore. Right, and we want to be you know the center of the culture. So what happens when the church is not the center of the culture? 
Well, so I've done a lot of talking on this. Attributions of marginality depend on our assumptions about what is at the center. So if you think that power is at the center, you know, Christ comes with a different sort of power. It's a powerless power. And maybe when the church is not at the center anymore, maybe it's back where it belonged, which is at the edges or at the margins, speaking into the center or among the marginalized. I mean, Christ dies outside of the center. He's not in the center of Jerusalem, triumphant. You know, uh, Calvary is like in the suburbs. <laughs> it's, you know, it's in, it's on the outskirts. Um, and he, of course, dies as a marginalized figure. And nobody is with him at the end. It was his mother. If you can't get your mother to stay with you, I mean, what good are you? I mean, <laughs> And and he also that's who he talked to for the most part was the marginalized, the marginalized, yeah, the people on the outside exactly. looking in, right? And yeah. so I think I think our anxiety in North American society is more related to the fact as the church that we are no longer like the power players anymore, and that's where we kind of want to be. You know, we want to be seen as the kind of power, um, right? And uh, that's not where uh, that's not where you know, the least or the last or the the lost or the laughed at <laughs> or the left behind ones in life are to be found. I agree. And and so we've kind of got that complex uh, that, well, there must be something, you know, we're being persecuted because we're not the center of attention anymore. We're not the, as you said, the power. And that's, I th maybe, maybe, and I don't know for, the, this is just a thought, that's exactly what God is doing with the church now, is I'm going to put you where you need to be, not necessarily where you want to be. And it's going to be on the marginalized, and, and that, because that's where the people are, and that's where they need to hear the gospel the most. It well, isn't it's this, I think it's also a misunderstanding of suffering. You know, it, it, so if you're suffering in Christ, um, the result is always clarity and strength it's never a weakness right you know? uh, so it's for what are we suffering and if we're suffering because you know we're no longer powerful and popular and um, and the, you know and uh, and we don't occupy you know positions of uh, cultural prominence anymore if that's if that's the sort of suffering then I think that's what God is undoing in our time. Yeah, he needs to as well, because that gets in the way of the gospel. You know, we need to get out of our, sometimes we need to get out of our own way. Let's talk a little bit about um, your, um, who has been important in your life, mentors. And I do make, make that plural because I believe that we have mentors at different stages or seasons of our lives. Who are some of those people for you? Yeah, I've, you know, I've been incredibly blessed with uh, people who saw things in me before I could see any of them, of them in myself. You know, I had a guy take me aside once and he said, um, he said, so when are you going to go back to school? I said, I said, well, look, I've got a family. I've got these kids. I said, I can barely afford anything. He says, how about if I pay for, you know, your entire PhD studies? Um, an incredible person who... Uh, you know, I still spend good time with, and um, and, and he prefers not to have his name uh, shared. <laughs> um, but um, also, there are those kind of uh, heroes and of faith who um, uh, you know kind of cheer you on along the way. And I can I can think of kind of countless people, um, and and a lot of them are kind of nameless people. You know, people. Uh, who pray for you, and you can feel the kind of tug of God along the way. Um, there have been people outside of the church communities, church community directly, that I've learned a lot from. Uh, one was um, someone I, I met when I was at Lutheran World Relief, and he was a he was a huge donor to global causes, and uh, he was also the president and CEO of the Marriott Corporation. Uh, his name was Arnie Sorensen. He died at sixty two years of age. Uh, from uh, cancer, um, and um, 
and, and Arnie was uh, a remarkable. And so, with people, for people who you know, we were talking about people who say they're too busy to you know to prioritize church. Arnie was in church every Sunday, and he was uh, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, the largest hotel chain in the world. You know, at one point, I think they had 750,000 employees or some incredible number, and was in church at his little Lutheran parish in Washington D.C. Uh, every Sunday, but a man of uh, of great faith, and, uh, and 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 always found time for people too. You know, for people who think that they're too important for others. So those are just some examples of of people along the way. I've I've been very very blessed with people who uh, believed in me before and and more than I could have ever believed in myself. I re- I asked that question of of the people I I talk to because I think so many people don't think. I don't have a mentor. I wish I did have a mentor. And I think that hearing these stories of who these people are for the people I talk to, sure you do. You just didn't realize it. And to thank God that those people are in your lives or, or were in your life uh, at one point. That's to a get really important right. question, Ed. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for putting that question on your list. Yeah, thank you for answering it, too. Um, so... You had mentioned uh, before when we were talking about poetry, and I know that uh, that is something that's uh, near and dear to your heart, and it's something that I want to be near and dear to my heart, but I I, I struggle with that. I mean, I, I've I've read Shakespeare, and I like to read Shakespeare uh, for for just pleasure, which is kind of strange, I think, um, for most people, uh, but I get a, a kick out of it, but can you share with us some of that, um, uh, that, some poetry that's important to you? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, my favorite poet, and in fact, I was just sharing this uh, with a friend uh, a couple of days ago, uh, is named Derek Walcott. And uh, he uh, is a poet who I think was haunted by God. And in many ways, his poetry is kind of lined with religious language or language about God. And in some ways, Poetry is more powerful than prose. Um, you know, it's more b- because it, because it, because if you think that the truth, um, although it begins in the here and now, the truth goes beyond here and now. The truth is transcendent. And poetic language is very similar. It, it, it speaks in images and in forms and it speaks kind of like on the angle. So poetic language kind of comes in on the angle. And he's got this piece called Love After Love that I, that I, that I love. <laughs> uh, can I, can I share it? Uh, so he says, the time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit. Feast on your life. You can hear the kind of Christ images there. You know, who is the stranger who has loved you all your life, who you, who you ignored for another, who knows you by heart, <laughs> mm-hmm. who, who you neglect and run from, but yet uh, is in pursuit of you? Of course, that's the, a Christ figure. There's the great Eucharistic images of, you know, give, and he, he flips them on purpose, you know, it's poetic mischief. You know, so rather than give bread and wine, he says give, rather than take, eat, take bread, take wine, he, he flips it and he says give wine, give bread. But even that last line, sit, feast on your life. So if you think capital L life, you know, and, and feasting on your life. So I, I, I think there's, there's, just, there's a power that comes in poetry. This notion of the mirror is a very powerful image as well. Um, you know, um, the images that we create in a social media age, um, 
In fact, there's a poet, Derek, uh, excuse me, uh, W.H. Auden, who says, the image of myself which I create in my own mind in order that I might love myself is much different than the image of myself which I create in the minds of others in order that they may love me. And if you think about the kind of image creation that happens on social media, that's a part of what we're talking about. And if you think, if you think of that we are created in the image of God, and yet we try to create ourselves, which is what false you know, I mean, a false creation. We try to re- create ourselves or idols. Those are idols. <clears throat> Excuse me. We try to create ourselves with this other image as if the image of God is not enough. So we have all of these other images. The image in which we're created is not enough. The image is we're recreated in the image of Christ as if that's not enough. So the, so I think poetry can get at a lot of those things. And speaking of mirrors, um, you asked about uh, a, a quote that has stuck with me and about a mentor. And so, and how mentors can come from often unlikely uh, places. So, about 25 years ago, I was speaking at a, 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 a Christian family camp in uh, Michigan called Camp Arcadia, and I must have been a little bit too obsessed or self-occupied with my own uh, uh, stories of self. And a woman gave me a gift at the end of the week. She had been listening carefully all week. She gave me a gift. And she said, now, I want you to unwrap it after you leave from this camp. Like, don't unwrap it until after you leave. And so um, I did once I got to the car. And I have it here because I've kept it with me the entire the entire time uh, since 25 years. It's, it's, it's in my, uh, my bag everywhere I go. And it's a mirror. Speaking of mirrors, uh, it's a mirror. And so in a mirror, you can see an image of yourself. And then over the mirror, you can see uh, four words. So if I were to have like a billboard, that's... <laughs> sure. How's that question go? If you had a billboard... Yeah, I'm going to give you a billboard, and this is going to be what you want people to see yeah. as much as possible. It would be these words on this mirror. So I'm going to hold up the mirror, hopefully that you can see yourself in the mirror. Can you see yourself? Can you see yourself? I do. <laughs> that's it's, so very very true <laughs> it's not about you <laughs> so when things are going well in your life <clears throat> uh, give praise to God because it's not about you Yep. and when things are not going well in your life don't get too far down because uh, it might not be about you God might be up to something through you for the sake of someone else to see what you are going through yourself and when you think that you've accomplished something that's great, it's not about you. Don't you know? It's it's the power of God at work in you, the gifts of God that He has given to you. So I really have tried hard to take that by heart. I also think back to your first question about vocation. Um, I think uh, many young people go searching within to try to figure out what their vo- vocation is, and I think that's a wasted search. I don't think you can find yourself by looking within. I think we find ourselves by looking outside of ourselves, looking first to the gaze of God, the God who is actually looking at us, and then looking next to the need of our neighbor. So it's around love of God and love of neighbor, and that's where vocation um, comes to fruition and comes to full fruit. So it's really not about you or me. Right. I, I, Jesus said that um, really he sums up the law as it's about loving God and loving your neighbor. And you're using that word. It's a church word for the most part, vocation, uh, not vacation, but vocation. It's a calling. Uh, but it really is. Again, it's not about in here. It's not about us. It's about others. And so I think of that acronym JOY um, is a good acronym for a person's life. It's Jesus, others, and then yourself. That's because right. but because he says you do love others as you love yourself. You don't neglect yourself, but it's always thinking outside, always looking over. Always, yes, exactly. And, and, and so you think about our culture, it's self-occupied, yeah. self-obsessed. It's all about me all the time. Yep. You know, and so this is this. I think this is a. So if I had a billboard, I'd put that up on the billboard. It's not about you, and just to kind of provoke people to ask the question. Hmm, I wonder who it's about. Then who's it about? And right. They start, and once they start thinking about the other, then maybe they can think about the one who is totally other, God, and then the other who is your neighbor. Yep. The other who is your brother and your sister. I love it. 
I love it. So that's the name of this episode. It's not about you. Um, we talked about two books so far. Uh, I'd like to see if you've got a third one that you would recommend or gift uh, to somebody. Uh, so I love this little book here. It's called uh, Prayer for Joy. Martin Franzman. Yeah. And uh, it just has these beautifully written prayers um, that you can kind of meditate on. Lord, give us all a heart of quick compassion wisdom to plan and execute before the too late of our action breeds the swarms of scorpions whose sting shall make us all long for death we cannot find <laughs> yeah it's got it's just got some great poetic pieces even one to the god who is the giver of wine to make glad the hearts of men <laughs> I got to get a copy of this book. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful little volume. It is. So this is this is a this is more theological and more technical. Okay, the Dietrich Bonhoeffer book. I'll have a copy of that, and then the the patient ferment of the early church. Who? That's really th that's a that's a uh, that's a scholarly book. The patient yeah. Ferment of the early church. Who's the author of that? I don't have it with me. Okay, I, I, I I'll look it up then. A, his last name starts with a K. Okay. Um, ugh. Hang on. Uh, yeah, I apologize. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, it's I'll be able to AI something. Yeah, yeah Google's a wonderful thing. I'll be able to figure it out. I'm sorry. So. Not a problem. Hey, as we wrap this up, though, we've we've been going for a while, and and uh, I just is there anything that you thought I should ask you and I didn't get to? No, I I I, I want to thank you for this ministry, this podcast ministry. Uh, <laughs> the and and your. So I do a lot of talking, <laughs> too much, and a lot of interviewing. And uh, let me just reflect a little bit. Uh, a lot of interviewers, interviewers can't get out of the way of what's happening, and they can't get with the flow of the conversation. So I want to really commend you uh, for not making it about you. How about that? And then secondly, for really keying in I mean, you provided the questions, which were really helpful, but then you also provided a kind of flexibility to key into where the conversation was going, where the spirit was taking the conversation, where I was taking the conversation, whatever. So you really have a gift here. And so I want to encourage you to you know, keep doing this. Uh, you, you need to be broadcast more frequently. Oh, here we go. I have uh, a, a helpful person in the room here who uh, heard my uh, my humble cry yes. and has looked up the patient ferment of the early church written by Alan Kreider. It does start with a K. K-R-E-I-D-E-R. -E -E Got it. Yeah, it's, I, I cannot recommend it enough. It's actually, it's, it's, I, I don't want to overstate it, but it'll change your life because, uh, because you know, patience is... Uh, in fact, one of the points he makes is that the, the early church wrote about the virtue of patience more than any other virtue. So think about that, right? And That's deep. How impatient yeah. people are. Right? What's the shortest unit of time imaginable between when the light turns green and the car behind you honks? Okay? <laughs> we were the only culture that stands in front of a microwave oven and shouts at it. Hurry up! It doesn't get faster than a microwave oven, right? I mean, we get frustrated when, you know, things don't go our way instantaneously. And then we treat other people like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning at this late age that patience is what love is about. Love is patient. So um, I, I highly recommend this volume. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I'm I, as you're saying that, I'm thinking... If anybody had to be hurried, it would have been Jesus knowing he only had, what, the three Passovers to work with uh, before his crucifixion. And yet he walked everywhere he went. <laughs> walked everywhere he went. He was never hurried. Nope. He, you know, he set his face toward Jerusalem. He didn't let anybody hurry him along. He had his own pace. He had his own tempo. And that's it. That's part of, that's it. So he lives this virtue for us. And, you know, the patience of God is our salvation. That's in, that's in Scripture. We, none of us would be saved if God were not patient with us. That's exactly right. Well, on and that we note. Have, and then, so, yeah. 
So, uh, <laughs> starting with me, I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> My friend, John Nunes, thank you so much Dad, for being with thanks us. Thanks for this ministry. You're really good at this. Hey, I enjoy it. That's that's why it's probably, I come across that way because I'm just having fun. I'm having fun. Great, and you have a great voice. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, God right. gets the credit, but sometimes my mom does take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. If it's your mother, it's never wrong. <laughs> nope, I agree. Thank you All so right. much, John Nunes. Blessings. Yeah, thanks so much, Ed Blonsky. Be well. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Reflection. Reflection is a weekly podcast produced by St. Matthew Lutheran Church. And we are in Hawthorne Woods, Illinois. You can connect with St. Matthew by going to our website. And it is www.stmats.net. And there's a link in the show notes. But if you want to type it in, it's www.stmatts.net. If you find yourselves in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, where we are in Hawthorne Woods, We'd love to see you at one of our services or other events here at St. Matthew. We are about one hour northwest of downtown Chicago, kind of easy to get to. And actually, we're only about a half hour's drive from O'Hare Airport. You can also connect with us on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and we are also on Instagram. Our podcast music was provided by the podcasthost.com and Elitu, the podcast maker. Find your own free podcast music over at thepodcasthost.com forward slash free music. I'd like you to rate and review this podcast wherever you're getting it from. Uh, and that helps us to reach more and more people. So we'd love to have you do that for us. Now, I pray that God will richly bless you. And I invite you to join us again next time for more Reflection. Reflection.